This week's interview is with Peter Zilke. We talked about moving to another country, the excitement and the learning from being out of your comfort zone, how Agile helped him to discover he could actually enjoy work, how coaches sometimes can be patronizing their coaches and why that's a really bad thing. And last but not least, we also talked about learning, how it keeps making space for us and helps us in life in general. Peter was invited by Michael and Audrey. Let's hear what they say about him. Somebody who really embodies in terms of choosing to live a different way of functioning on this planet that, you know, just started as a scrum master and realized, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something very different going on here that is possible for us as human beings. And his name is Peter Zilka. So, um, so That's he, Peter, he, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Except his hair is longer now. Yeah, well, it keeps on changing length, by the way. All right. Yeah, so that's Peter. That's, and... that, 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 that's, that's how people are these days. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so to... just, just incredible. I mean, he was going through our, our, our second level leadership program that we offer in the Agile space. And, you know, we saw, saw the peer feedback that somebody had given, they gave, him, they gave somebody a 10 out of 10 on the scoring. And we went and said, like, what? How did someone get a 10 out of 10? We look at it and we go, Oh my God, he wrote something called The Letter to My Ego. The Letter to My Ego. And it was really just this profound awareness of the deeper teaching of the work of how his ego was actually running the show and how he had a choice at every moment to show up as his best self or be taken wow. out. It's so that of- sounds really like a, a, a very interesting person to talk to. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for inviting um, I'm Yves Hanul from Who's Agile. My pronouns are he and him. Welcome to my channel. You see a lot of Agilists around me on this screen. If you want to hear me interviewing, please click that subscribe button because these are the people that I've invited so far. If you think I'm missing people, let me know in the comments. And that like button, well, if you liked today's interview, don't forget to click it. Hello and welcome everyone and welcome Peter. Uh, I think it's how I pronounce it. Is that Peter? Is that it's, I know I know every variant now. It's like Peter, <laughs> Peter, Pete. It doesn't matter. I listen to everything. Okay, that's interesting to know already. <laughs> so that and that brings us to immediately an in, kind of introduction because we've been talking just before without actually asking that name. So Peter, um, I'm interviewing you from Belgium, and uh, if where are you from? Where are you situated at this moment? So I'm located near Zurich, um, a little bit south of Zurich. So, so I'm, I'm this... going to show this. So I, I would say Belgium for myself, and let's bring you bring you on screen, Zurich. Uh, thank you, Google, if uh, he wants, if they want to help out. That's that Zurich. So, yes. That's that's, Zurich. Yes, actually, if I want to go with you, uh, that would take you uh, take me a lot longer to go there. Uh, and it also means that um, it's actually not that long trip if I compare it to some other things, because I, for me, it's uh, now uh, 28 minutes after five, and I think you're in the same time zone. Is this correct? This is correct, same time zone for me, yes. So let's bring you back on screen. And we jumped right into that. So um, Peter, um, for, for everyone who's here and who doesn't know you, uh, what do you want people to know about you? Yeah, so I think I already brought up the name because the name is to me something very, yeah, to, it's a question that is very simple to to me, but uh, might sound a bit like why do why do why do you know so many so many pronunciations? Because my story is I was born in Poland, um, I was I, I was raised in Germany, um, but then I also decided twelve years ago now to, to see a little bit of the world. So I lived in in Spain in Barcelona, I lived in Malaysia, um, I lived in Australia. And now I, I think two, more than two years ago, um, I, I moved to, to Switzerland. And this is where, with the name, it's like, you, because in every country it was a bit different. So if it's Peter, 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 um, to me, it really doesn't matter. Um, so yes, that's, that's my, my background from a, from a nationality point. Um, and other than that, yes, job-wise, um, I think six years ago, I, I started working in, in the space of agility, um, where to me, a lot of things actually got started since then, um, went through different companies, industries, um, where I find myself now working as an independent um, agile coach, trying to 
to really, my vision is humanizing workplaces again, because I think there is still a lot that needs to be done to make workplaces human again. Um, and this is my vision where I want to, you know, just take it step by step by step to get closer to this. Well, let's go back a little bit to that earlier part of the, the naming. It's uh, it's something that usually we don't think about. For example, when we we give uh, names to our children, that uh, if they want to go out in other parts of the world, that their their names are not easy to pronounce. And I think for you, Peter, that's a name that for most countries is still kind of acceptable and kind of known. Um, I totally didn't think about it for my children, and I know at least for one of them it's not that easy if, if we go to other kind of countries. Uh, but I have friends, uh, local friends here that um, is a Belgium, and um, yeah, where the or the, the woman is uh, is, is Dutch speaking, uh, just like like I am, but. Uh, the the man her man her partner is uh, is Spanish speaking so they thought about it right from the start okay we want to give our children names that can be pronounced and in Dutch and in Spanish and in English and so they thought about it and I was like oh yeah that's something you could do even when you think about names <laughs> yeah it's a it's a different uh, way of thinking right about the names like oh did we include that it's like what if we were... and nowadays I think it's so important because. A l I think back then, like 30, 40 years ago, people didn't think about moving countries as much as we do nowadays. So no. maybe this topic even becomes more important. Exactly. And that's, that's why I bring it up, because, yeah, maybe some people are watching that say, oh, we, we didn't think about that kind of thing. Um, it's um, it, it brings a different kind of way on how to pr pronounce a name. How do we how we do talk about things? Yeah. So it's a, it's already a nice, uh, nice little um, extra to 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 bring for people. Um, so thank you for introducing that and, and to make us think about that. Uh, I want to come into that first question that uh, what is something that uh, people usually don't know about you but still has influenced you a lot in, in who you are? Yeah, so so I thought about this, this question and I think to me there are two elements that really define what influenced me and I think also highly defined who I am at the moment. And I say at the moment because I don't know what's what's in the future for me. So I think the first part is really um, getting to know my now partner, my wife, uh, because when I met her, and this is now I have to be very careful, uh, 15 years ago. <laughs> when it's I recorded, her, eh? so now we have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's 15 years ago. Um, I think I was in a state um, where I was stuck and um, stuck in terms of I think everything in life is already prepared for me in terms of there is not a lot of options out there. Um, mm -hmm. And what I think what my wife helped me to, to understand is that there are options out there and that, you know, a lot of times it's just about having this leap of faith. For me, it was always my dream was um, moving to Barcelona because Barcelona is um, a city that is very close to my heart and always was. But for me, that was never on the table. To me, that was like mm -hmm. this dream, but it was never a possibility until she got into my life. And I, I remember it until now. It's like she once asked, why is it actually not possible? And I was like, yeah, I mean, because it's just not, right? And she was like, who says that? Um, and I, I think- just so she moved to Barcelona and you had to go back and grab her, get her back or something like that. So we are both, both, we are both in Germany. And one day it was really like, hey, we should, if we want to do this, we should just try. Um, and we started the process of, hey, what is it that we need? Oh, it would be nice if we would have one job there. So she applied for a job, she got the job. And then it was up to me. It's like, I mean, you need to follow. And this is how we moved to Barcelona. And with that, she opened this, this completely new world to me of, oh, I can put myself out there. There are options out there. And also I think through this, um, I learned a lot about myself, about what I'm capable of. Um, and that was a lot more than I thought um, before I met her, because just to, to be in an international environment, um, I learned there very quickly that for me, it's super easy to work with people, connecting with people, building that rapport very early on. Um, Even if it's was... a different culture, because then you go from, yeah. Yeah. And I think maybe it was also, it was easy to me because I mean, being born in Poland, uh, being, being raised in Germany, I, I always had it in me. Like, I'm, I mean, I spoke the languages, I speak Polish, I speak German. I also, back then I already spoke Spanish because I was so passionate about, oh. about Barcelona. Um, so, so you had everything ready, except that you didn't realize it, something um, like that. 
the mind was yeah. there. The mind was just saying like, no, you can't. It's like, and you know, just having that, I think that influence, and this is something where I think a lot of people don't know that um, actually I can, I would say my, my wife opened up a lot of, um, it opened a lot of doors to me, which then I think also continued with us moving to different countries, going to diff through different cultures, uh, which I think I would, I would never, never go back and say like, I would change a single thing about it because that was, that was amazing. Not everything worked out, but every mm -hmm. experience now, when I look back, it's like, wow, it taught me something. It taught me something very important that is now part of me. So I think okay, so that 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 looks very nice because indeed that yeah, it's a little bit like you say we 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 block ourselves in our thinking something that is not possible, um, and then having someone challenging that, and if it's a partner, if it's it doesn't matter who, but someone that that challenges that that makes us really rethink. Okay, why why do we, is it not possible? And there might be options, there might be things that it's actually not possible. Uh, but yeah, in a lot of cases, it's there is a lot more possible than we realize that. Uh, it's, uh, totally. It's a nice it's story. A it's, especially, the, the, uh, the, I like the example about moving to another country because that's what I hear so many people talking about, so many people, even for me, I was when I was studying, I had friends who, who were uh, moving to other countries for... for um, yeah, for an internship. Now, I was living on welfare in Belgium, and they they told me that I couldn't do that. I was not allowed to do that. So, yeah. Uh, and ever since, I had that same idea. I wanted to move to another country. And I remember in, in 2009, I, I said to my partner, there was, there was actually a, a client stopping. And at the same time, there was a training that I followed for two years stopping. And, and I remember the moment I started that training, so two years earlier, like, oh, now I cannot go to another country again for another two years. And so the moment that training stopped, I realized this is the moment. And I basically, I told everybody around me, this is the moment that we're going to do it. And I, I refused all kinds of jobs because I really wanted to do it. Even if we had three children at that time, it was really like, I have no idea how we're going to do that. But that's, at some point you realize that if I want to do it, this is the right moment uh, or, yeah. Maybe it's not the right moment, but every moment after that is even harder. So yeah, in that sense, it's the right moment. That, and that's the point, right? We never know. It's like, I mean, what we know is that the future is uncertain. So it's like this waiting for just the right moment. It, I mean, and it's a lot about just, I mean, do and also think about what is the worst thing that could happen. And for us, it, it was always, even then when we moved to other countries, we can always go back. So we have family at home. We, we have a friend system. Um, and that always, I think, allowed us and so us. what what time was that that you did that move that was in 2010 so 12 2010 years ago. so 12 years ago so there was already the internet there was options to to reach out to other people and and, and stay connected did you know anyone in in um, in spain at the moment that you no moved one. to there no no wow. we didn't know anyone it was we we basically we went there we booked hotel rooms i was looking for, for so you didn't have a room you didn't have um, a, um, a house or anything, eh? So you... nothing. No, it was all this. Ex and it was a lot of excitement. And if we if we look back now, and we sometimes do it when we sit uh, on the couch in the evening, it's like, hey, do you remember how exciting that was? And how mm -hmm. also interesting enough, we we somehow at least that's how we remember it. We weren't scared of that move, and there were mm. so many uncertain things. When nowadays, when I when I put my mind to it, it was like wow, there was a lot of reason to actually freak out. But I think it was this purpose, right? This purpose of, hey, I really want that. This is like one of my, my dreams to move there. And that somehow helped you and supported you along the way to, you know, go through the housing, the, the work, the administrative stuff in the foreign language. Because, I mean, you can speak, I, I was able to speak Spanish, but then going to, you know, to all the offices, administrative things, that's a different kind of thing to do. Language. Um, <laughs> But we manage. So, um, and this is where nowadays when I, when I hear people, it's like, oh, we are thinking, just go for it. And not everything will go as, as you plan. But this is, this is, I think, where growth happens a lot of times because you have the situation once, you learn out of it. And the next time it will be less painful. So it's a lot about this, as I said, this leap of faith, really.
Yeah, I remember. Well, I, I really like the, the thing that you said about uh, stress and, and not knowing. I had a similar experience when we were, I was actually driving a truck to France with basically everything in the back that we took with us. And I had my oldest son sitting next to me. And at some point in, so we were one day that we were driving. And somewhere in that day, he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of scared because I, I have no idea what will happen. We didn't have a house at the time, a similar kind of situation and that was a very intense conversation i had with him talking like yo I, it's true i have no idea what will happen and um, at the same time i'm scared but it's not a scare that that freezes me it's a scare that excites me and, and it's a scare that okay uh, and and that's that's it it doesn't mean that the fact that i'm doing it and that i'm totally not scared it, it's it's kind of the courage that we have to do this and yes, a lot of things are unsure, and it it doesn't freeze me. That was a really, it was I don't know if it was more powerful for him or for myself just having that conversation, yeah. because he was he was seven at that time, so I don't even know if he realized all the things that we were talking about. But that's that's the kind of thing I completely understand that it's it's the excitement, it's everything there. Um, I don't know if you had children at the time, but for me as a parent, it was also like, okay, we have to radiate um, to our children that everything's going to be okay, mm. even yeah. if we were scared and even if we had no idea what will happen. Um, and that's that's the kind of thing. And I, I, I've i learned it before, but for me, it was a different kind of level of leading people with, with scares, with being scared and with unknown and um and it's it's very um yeah it's it's very touching emotion to have and and to feel very deeply connected at that time both with myself as, as with my son about okay this is it is a scary situation and uh, and i can imagine well I, I really like that you bring this story because that's that's the kind of thing that influences you a lot i can imagine this is also something that um yeah, it, it 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 can make or break a relationship. I mean, if you both move to another country, at uh, I I remember thinking at that time, wow, we need to be very strong as a partnership, mm -hmm. and and it 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 is scary also. Uh, but again, it didn't hold me back, but because I knew that this this might be the best thing that will happen to us. And that's that's what happened to us. Really, it's like um, it was. It, it it helped in so many ways and also growing as, as as individuals and growing together and also seeing how do we how do we how do we support each other in different kind of scenarios which i think just this again this leap of faith just brings with it it's like there are just different challenges than in your comfort zone right because a lot of times we just love it because it's so comfortable in this zone mm -hmm. that we know with our supporting system around us um but it just helped us a lot to grow as individuals well and and like you say when you go back to well you go back when you go to another country you leave your support system well you could go back but basically the next few months you're on your own you don't have any friends there so you have to do everything together but that also creates that bound of course huh? because you know that you'll do it together and there are moments that you I, i'm sure that you both had moments where you were angry at each other and it was kind of hard yes. because you couldn't talk to friends because there's no friends around and you don't want to call back home and say to your parents or to your friends that this is not working. So you need to kind of work through it together. I, I don't know, at least that's was it, how it was for us. But yes. uh, but the, you, in the end, you end up a lot stronger there. Huh? Totally, it's, yes. Uh, and it's it's a very um, very powerful experience, I would say. And it opens so many doors, right? I mean, because if, when I started uh, answering the question, I said like there are two elements, and I think one element is surely meeting my wife and the the way she opened doors. And I think by that, other doors opened, like in, in our time in Australia, which was in 2019, um, I got to know Audrey and Michael, who were also um, guests on, on, your, on, 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 your, um, on your video here. Yeah. And I think they are, and I think this is, some people know in my inner circle, but they are just another two individuals who just so influenced who I am now, I think who influenced me so strongly within the last two years. Because they, I think similar to the experience I described before with, with my partner, with my wife, it's like they again opened up completely new doors into finding out who I am and what drives me and how much of this is actually a concept that I built and just realizing who I am really is like, who's the true Peter? 
and is there a true Peter? So I think these, the, the three people, right, really my wife, Audrey and Michael, um, I think who influence me and keep on influencing me. Um, now, I think, yeah, this is where, this is why, what, what I am at the moment making this interview with you. I think it's those three people really. Well, and it's uh, what I hear also in these, the, where these two parts of the story connect is that you're open for these experiences and you're open for having these conversations and having, yeah, open for, for learning and getting out of your comfort zone. Because um, I, I, I love Michael, I love Audrey, who had lots of conversations with them. Michael, I know all, actually already from 2007 back. And yeah, there is no moment that you talk to Michael that you you leave, basically you every time I talk with him, I leave a different person because he asks so many questions or talks about himself in a way that that makes me rethink who I am. That's and but you need to be open for it. Uh, that's that's what I'm hearing you say as well. Is that um, because yeah, the moment your your partner said, "Well, what you could still go to to Spain," you could have said, "No, let's let's not let's let's keep it a dream and and let's not touch it because it's a dream and it could be go bad and whatever," and and then you would not not be the Peter that you are today, uh, and then you probably would regret it for the rest of your life that you never went and and your or your partner would regret it that you you talk about it but you never go and yeah <laughs> that usually doesn't end well so. no it doesn't and but isn't it also if um what we do a lot of times in life mm -hmm. where we say like hey once i get retired at 65 67 then exactly. i will do all those things where i always say is like who who guarantees you that you will get until 65 and this is i think what drives me nowadays a lot um it's like who gives me the guarantee that i will have this time later so that's where a lot of uh, yeah, and it's it's not only that. Uh, I I see. I have yeah. I don't want to say say too much to not uh, um, um, yeah clear out who I'm talking about. But I have someone um, in in my inner circle. Let's let's put it that way. That um, yeah, I know when this person talks and it's a lot. Yeah, when this happens, then I will do this. And and sometimes that this is is in the very near future. Uh, and then the whole world, everything will change. Or when this, this, then everything. No, no. You, you have to be, your luck or your happiness does not depend on X or Y. And it doesn't matter if it's, because Spain, going to Spain will not make you happier or less happy. It's just an experience. But, yes. um, and and you can be open for it and it will definitely change you. But that it, if, if, if it's about, okay, when this happens, then I will be happy. Or if I, that's, that's like, if I play the lotto, then I will be happy if I win so many millions. Well, if you're not happy with, with yourself, with lot, a lit, little money, you probably won't be happy with yourself with lots of money uh, or with lots of friends over low. No, you need to first look on... Yeah, and, and start looking and accepting everything and, and trying out stuff. So that's um, it's a lot more about that. Um, and usually then it happens a lot more to do this kind of stuff because when we dare to, to, to jump into this. So that's already a very deep conversation that we had. I like it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's probably also... Yeah, it's 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 both a nice, good question to jump into and at the same time we go very, very deep. Let's uh, let's move to that second question about if you had not been to IT or if you, for me, I, I'm still doubting a little bit about the IT part. Basically, the question is, if you had not been doing what you do today, what would you be doing? Is there something else in your path? Is there something that you were predestined to do or? I think what I, I could give you the, the alternative scenario. We, we never know how it would have played out, but I think exactly, I would, yeah. what I would do is I would probably be stuck in a workplace um, where I would completely be knocked out by the system. Just someone who is not engaged, someone who is not enjoying what he did, because that's how I saw work until I figured out and found this agility thing. I thought about work is something that will give you a salary by the end of month and it's just getting from month to month to month. Um, this is how I considered work. Um, there was no... I had no the work awareness. is money and that's it. That's, that's it. It. It, it. It's not enjoyable. It's something you have to do. Um, because I didn't know it otherwise. It's like my, my parents come from, I mean, production workers. So I know from, from them what I saw is like, hey, coming from work, being tired, but earning a, a decent salary. Um, but th that was my reality. 
And also when I started with jobs, it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really love the interaction I had with coworkers, but to me, it was nothing I thoroughly enjoyed. And for me, there was like this, I didn't just have this awareness of actually you can, you can do work and you actually can enjoy it. So I think my alternative, if I would have not ended up in what I do now, would really be stuck in the workplace, maybe getting promoted because I think what I, I always had this, I always, what I, whatever I did, I always tried to do my best. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think I would have not gotten to a place where I say like, wow, I actually enjoy reading into stuff on Saturday, on Sunday, working on, you know, connections, um, chatting with people, communicating with people on the weekend, after work, how it is now. Because to me, it was just like, hey, I leave the office at 5.30, 6 o'clock. It's, oh, finally over. I'm out of there. Um, so I think this but, but would thank really God it's Friday and oh totally. God, it's Monday again. That, yes, that's kind like, of oh, yeah. on Sunday evenings, like, you know, my anxiety would usually rise. It's like, oh no, Monday morning is then, is, is coming up again. It's like not sleeping well from Sunday to Monday. I think this would probably have been my reality if I'm being, yeah, I mm -hmm. think agility in th that case really rescued me from, from doing that and from following okay. that path. I like that answer because usually when people answer to this question, it's about the kind of job, but this is much more on the deeper level about, okay, what does it mean? And and now what you I'm hearing is, okay, I'm very passionate. I, I love the things I'm doing. And the alternative version is basically a kind of burned out version of you uh, or and and that would would not be happy about the life and and um, and what I'm hearing is that well I, if I speak for myself I don't think I've in 20 years I ever had the feeling oh thank God it's Friday I, I never had this I, I it's it's I don't have like you say on on Sunday evenings oh God it's, it is, will be Monday that's no I, I'm not going to say I've never had a bad day at work we all have bad days of course we have uh, yes. But, but it's but it's about the different kind of energies and and some well on the best days I get way more energy out of work than 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 when I started that day, um, and and that's the kind of thing what indeed for me agility brought as well is like okay, figuring out uh, the kind of thing that uh, that is that is like to do and and what uh, that is nice and so that is for that was the same thing for you and could you say a little bit on what. Um, what triggered that? How how did you make that shift, or what what made you go into that shift? Again, I can I can build that connection to my wife because my wife had a friend, um, and she basically said like, Peter, I, I see you. You just don't like your job. You just changed your job again. Um, still, you don't enjoy it. You work long hours, then you you commute for another one and a half hours home. Um, but you know, I'm working in this space, and I I think this role of a scrum master could really be something for you. Um, mm -hmm. And me. I never heard of it before. Never. It's like, Scrum, what, what? It's like, you know, and then I, I started reading into it and then going into a class. Um, and then also that friend of my wife, she was, she was able to get me on a project. Um, and this is how it started. And I very quickly figured out after, you know, going through all these scary moments of a role you didn't know about like three, four weeks ago, and you're now sitting in there. It's like, hey, I actually... I actually, it actually makes sense to me. It's like, wow, this is, this is amazing what, what you are able to do. is like working with people, seeing, you know, the, the patterns, understanding the patterns, understanding people, understanding behavior. Um, I very quickly noticed for myself there was a, there was a shift in energy, as, as you described. It's like after work, I, w I was not like completely drowning, but it was like, wow, that was good. That was a nice day, which... Honestly, Eve, I didn't have a lot of days like this before I started because it was usually like, oh, finally, like TG, TGIF really. Um, so mm. it was, again, a leap of faith because I quit my job that I had back then and I just like jumped right into wow. it without knowing. So, so that, also... that, that friend really had a good, I don't know, intuition to realize how, how that would work out because it's something... It's something you totally didn't know, you never heard of. So it's not that you talked about it and that you say, yeah, it's good for you. No, it's, it basically came out of the blue for you. But totally. that person really realized that, okay, this is something that, that Peter would would make Peter happy, happy basically. Yeah, because um, that was, and to me, this, you know, there are some of these moments in our lives where I think it's a key moment, but at the same time, I think it, it requires two things. First of all, you, you need someone who gives you that little spark. But then I think it's also this openness because 
I, I also witnessed a lot of people in, in, in my life where I think the openness, if the openness is lacking of trying something, of, of having this, you know, this faith into, hey, maybe it will work out, or also being okay with the alternative of, hey, this is not working out. And I think this is something that I was back then, I was, I was open enough to, to risk. Like, hey, worst case is it will not work out and I'll just find another job again in what I didn't like. Um, but I was very fortunate but that the, I found something. Did, did the fact that you were not happy in your current job at that moment help you to make the jump in the sense that I don't have anything I would... Uh, because I can imagine if it's a job that you kind of like, but it doesn't bring you energy, but you, you still maybe you like your, your, your colleagues or whatever, I could make it harder to make that jump or was there... Yes. So there was, there was nothing where I was really, I would say, like drawn to or passionate about that I was doing. So yes, that was, that was, so I, w I was not leaving something behind where I was like, you know, there is no, that was, it was okay. rather an easy decision. Yes. So that, that's also, well, okay, helps, of course, um, and I probably helped that person to realize that this job is not good for Peter, because if you can quickly make that decision, that, uh, that tells you already a lot. Um, yeah. But it's not because the old job is a bad thing that the new job is any better, of course. Uh, that was still something to, to jump for and, and to realize. So that's um, that's an interesting part. Now, if we, if we look back at all these kind of things, what would be for you the biggest, currently your biggest challenge and, and why is that a good thing for you? <laughs> okay, that, that, I was thinking about that one and I was I was trying to, I think to me, these are two things, two challenges, but then they become one. And I will explain why and also why it's good for okay. me. So I think what is still one of my, Michael and Audrey always call it leadership edges. It's like something mm -hmm. where you still need to, to work on. I think for me, it's really what I'm starting to recognize. I have this pattern of, I have a huge, a high desire to be liked. So I really, mm. I'm, I'm a social animal. There is like this desire that people like me and people like me very early on. Um, and with that comes another challenge because of that very early in a relationship and a connection, um, I'm trying very hard for that person to like me. And with that comes that I'm really not listening long enough to that person. So it's like, you know, this, this rush of, oh, I have to say something now, you know, to look good. So that person will like me. Um, so I think those two, and I think one of, one of this is actually a symptom. Um, and the other one might be the root cause, um, the root cause being the desire to be liked. Um, but why is this a good thing? I think the good thing about this one is I'm aware of it. I think this is something mm -hmm. that I'm, I was, I, I knew for a long time, but I was not able to accept it. So I knew this. I mean, I was always like this, you know, very early on, if someone, if I had a feeling, just a feeling that someone is maybe, you know, oh, not a fan of Peter. It was just like, ooh, you have to be careful around that person. Better even avoid that person. Um, but I think since I accepted that, it helps me a lot now in observing myself in how am I, how am I acting around a person I don't know? How do I also act around people that I do know for a long time? It's like, um, do I show similar patterns that I, that I did in the past? Um, and with that comes the, the listening. So I think the listening is also then listen because i mean you have a lot to say sure i i mean i as you can probably also see from this from this recording there is a lot i can say but it's really the listening for me and that i think i, I heard it recently it's like just stay curious for a little bit longer and that helps me to get away from me from my desire and focus more on the person who is on the other side um so at the same time i'm no I'm, I'm aware of it and i think this is this is something that that helps me and i'm i'm happy about it because by the end of the day um i can see my notes i'm making a lot of notes throughout the day and once i go over them at the end of the day there's a lot of oh oh this is what you did this is so I, i'm 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 mm -hmm. able to see patterns of of that behavior okay that's interesting and uh, but good um uh wait let me see how i phrase it so if you're working as a coach, does that hinder you in a way if you want to be liked? Because sometimes as a coach, we need to say the, the hardest part, or at least we need to show people a mirror because if we're just being being the nice guy, that doesn't always help them. Is that something you, you a pattern that you struggle with or how do you deal with that? So, so it, it, it really depends on the conversation we're having. If I know it's a, it's a coaching conversation, then I'm pretty good in taming myself and taking you know mm. steps back. Um, if it's just an, a talk conversation at a coffee machine, 
I feel like this advice monster is coming up. It's like, oh, oh, I know the solution for you. Mm. But you know what? Nowadays, I, it was in the past. It was like, hey, I know the answer. You don't have to uh, look any further. I know it. And I think this is something that Michael and Audrey really helped me to to work with, um, because that was kind of my concept that I built around me. You know, also with coming into agility, loving what I do. It's like, hey, I have the answer. I mean, yeah, you just ask me. Um, but with that, and I think I recently heard Brainy Brown explaining it in a beautiful way that was just like, oh, shit, she's talking about me. It's like with every advice that I gave, what she was saying is like, you're basically putting yourself a step up that person. You're basically saying, okay, you're not able to solve that issue, but I am able. So I'm better. I know how to solve it. And that really hit home when I heard it it's because my first reaction was like, oh, that's me. And I would say I'm doing it less. It feels very patronizing if you do that to, to someone. Eh? That you might it not is. realize it, but that's that's how how people might actually hate it when that happens. And and it doesn't matter if you're right or not. The fact that you do it and do especially the way you just described it, if if you put yourself on top of a person. Yeah, I've I've had people, both uh, teachers, coaches, that did that with me, and yeah. Basically, it doesn't help me. Uh, the main reason why I could not accept help when I was a teenager was because I had a lot of teachers around me that behaved that way. Yeah. Uh, I, I really yeah. have, a, when you were saying that, I had an image of one teacher and she's she's a great teacher. She, she spotted all the problems I had, but because she put herself on top of me, I totally didn't listen to her. And uh, I rejected basically everything that, that she could have taught me. Uh, and so, yeah, man. well, and I say it's a great teacher. I still see her as a great teacher because I know she has the expertise, but she's not a great teacher because of what you just, you just described. Uh, on the other hand, I have no idea how old she was, but she definitely was not one of the older teachers. So she was probably rather young and, and immature at the same level as what you're describing that in the beginning when we start in the kind of role we think our role is to to show people the best yeah. way and no <laughs> it's not always the case <laughs> and it was interesting because what i think what also helped me change or changing that behavior i'm not saying i'm done i think i'm still working progress um was a metaphor a friend all? a friend of we are yes totally but a friend offered me a, a metaphor she was saying saying like you know our, our beautiful lake we have in zurich if you're standing there and you have a basket of stones if you, and the stones represent all your knowledge that you have, all the tools, all the, all the great stuff that you've learned. If you, if you throw a stone into the lake, you will have that beautiful ripple effect right in the water. But what happens if you throw all the stones at once in the lake? You would not have it. Oof. You would just have a mess. And this is like where I was like, oh, oh. So in my recent, in my recent employment with, uh, with a big, big company, this is, this is a tool I tried. It's like, okay, at the beginning I was quiet. If there was, there was really this taking a step back, not throwing all my stones at once, but really listening longer. And as, as, what I, again, coming back to Michael and Audrey's work, it was a lot about not the doing part, but the being part. And I think that made a huge difference for, for me. Um, even though it was hard, I have to say, but what I also get then got by the feedback of others was really how it helped them, not like getting getting like taught by Peter. Right? Peter knows the answer. No, it was just like a lot of curiosity there. It's like, hey, you probably have a better answer to to your challenge because we are not in their realities, right? And this is, I think, something. That, and that it is brings such a it brings thing. the best it brings the best out of them eh? because then they realize oh I can do this and 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 yeah then then you're just uh, how would it say it in English uh, you're a, a, comp a and a companion with them so you're just walking with them yes. for a short while and then they move on and. I, I, what I liked also about the metaphor that we were talking if you talk about the lake is that um, uh, the, the the well. I'm not sure if it's the same metaphor, but the image I got is that you, you talked about throwing all the stones in it. But imagine if the water is very wild, if mm -hmm. it's very stormy um, at that moment. And that's usually when a lot of times when we coach people, there is storm and the, everything is boiling or whatever. Uh, it doesn't help to throw in stones because that wouldn't have an effect on them. Uh, it would not even calm down. So it's better to find a way to calm things down and only then throw in a stone because then you can see an effect 
and and I, that's definitely something I did in the past. Uh, it's like when when things were storming, and it's like, okay, now is the moment I have to act because I have to do something because yes, it's yeah. storming, and and I'm hired to do this, and 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 I'm the expert, and yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. it it doesn't help, but okay, it's easy to talk about that, um, and in retrospect, I think both of us we see a lot of moments where we did act like that. Uh, the hard part is in the action, in the storm, is trying to stay calm and trying to, yeah. yeah it's, and I think uh, this is where we can make level. a difference, right? I think this is where we as coaches coming in can make a difference because I like the metaphor that you use with the storm because what I always like to use is this of a lot of people drowning in a swimming pool. I mean, we have options as a coach, right? We can jump with them and also it's like, you know, or we can stand outside and say like, hey, what is the best solution now? How can we help these people drowning there? Um, so it's a lot about choices we also make. Um, but I'm also with you. It's, it's a lot of times this pressure that I think comes with this role of, hey, you're, you're the one supposed to fix all of this. Um, mm -hmm. Where I think we also have to be very kind to ourselves that, hey, we will probably not be able to fix that on our own. Um, and just also be kind to us, but also to the ones that we are working with. Um, because a lot of well, times it was built through years and even decades. So um, it's not just fixed with one beautiful sentence or a beautiful workshop. Well, the thing that you the, the, that came to mind when you say that when people hire us to fix something, they hire us because we will bring in something different, something different that they don't have. And if we act the exact way as they expect us to do, Basically, they could have done it themselves, then they didn't need us. And so we have to bring in something else. Um, and and yeah, it's, it's, I, I, for me, it's a hard balance. And I think there's a few conversations in this, this video series where we talk about that is that sometimes we have to bring in, because as consultants, there is that, that kind of balance. We have to sell ourselves, we have the solution. And at the same time, we have to be humble again to, to yeah. bring in okay what what's in it what what do the people already know and and our expertise might be indeed a little bit in staying calm into the storm and, and looking and asking questions so people can see oh actually a little bit like like your partner did with you like oh you actually think you cannot go to spain actually there there, there what is the possibility to go to spain and you cannot oh there is a storm in in the in the swimming pool and it looks like you will drown oh actually maybe you can stand up oh it, it Turns out that the water yeah. isn't that deep as, yeah. as as I thought it was. It's it's. I'm I'm thinking when you talked about uh, the storm in in the swimming pool. I I know there's some swimming pools in Belgium where they make uh, uh, what is it uh, with hydraulics? They make a kind of storm feeling, yes. yeah. and it feels very well to water. But in most parts of it, you can just stand up and and just stay there. It's hard because the water is moving all directions. And we have the tendency to swim and to try to, but basically, if you want, you could try to step and to to, to get out walking in it. Uh, we don't do it because it's much more fun. But if if you don't realize that that's the situation, you must feel uh, very. How would I say it? Yeah, very tempting to to mm. think about. I need I need to do something or I need to swim or whatever. And maybe it's just oh well. Did you try standing up? Oh, I didn't. <laughs> let's let's, and that's the kind of questions we we sometimes ask. Yeah? And that's a beautiful beautiful example because it's a lot also for us to show people there are there are choices that you can also have. There are options, which I think also is very hard because if the system knocked you out, it's like you don't you just don't see it anymore. Um, and also, if new people are coming in, they are very quickly dragged into that system. So I think for us, you're really standing on the on the sideline outside of that pool. And seems like, hey, what is actually happening? You could all stand, but you, are you aware of it? I think this is such an important element that we bring to, to organizations and also to the people in the organization. Yeah, and I think that's that's the kind of thing, trying to stay outside and trying to not get sucked into it. That, that's that's yes. some of the hardest part. And, okay. and, I, and the, the thing is, sometimes I, I like to jump in and I like to sometimes um, go and do the jobs of the people I'm coaching just to to understand when I'm in an organization, what does it mean to be a product owner? What does it mean to be a scrum master? And, and because every organization is different. And so it's good from time to time to, to go into that and maybe even being back to a developer to understand the challenges and then to go back up and then say, okay, uh, back up to the site, I mean, 
uh, to, to to look again from 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 the side and ask the meta questions about some of these mm -hmm. things. And yeah. that is um, that's uh, well, we jumped again with lots of energy and lots of ideas on this, and that kind of brings me to that to that next question about what drives you and i think you kind of answered it already previously so i'm i'm really interested to see if if i guess that answer so peter what is driving you what is your passion i think my passion is really i think my desire is to learn and when i say learn is i think one part was or is still learn tools techniques what can i do is there anything else and you could be a framework, a technique, um, how do I facilitate mm -hmm. workshops? But I think the most important part that I'm now, I think, exploring throughout the last two and a half years is really learning more about me. How do I work? Mm -hmm. How do I function? And also the question, how much, how much of what I thought is true is actually just a concept that I've built. The concept of, Ooh. oh, I know the answer. The concept of, Oh, you are just that, you know, you are this extrovert. It's easy for you to connect. It's like, how much of this is true? Um, so I think this is something where I'm super eager at the moment to find out about, oh, what is, what is actually really, who is Peter actually really? Um, and that's super fascinating because, you know, just the layer that I described previously, uh, this desire to be liked, I think this is super interesting because it's also about this, where's this pattern coming from? Um, but, you know, the first step for me is always to, be aware of it. And this is so exciting. I just love exploring more about where a lot of these patterns that I see on a daily basis, where they are coming from. Um, because the interesting part is the concept. I mean, a concept is built by us, but a lot of time there is not a lot of truth. So I can easily change the concept. If I decide tomorrow morning again about choices, I can decide to be a completely different concept. So it's really for me to go at the moment beyond that layer and see it's like who is peter really um and i think this is something that drives me a lot and helps me also in i think going through this going through challenges going through these leap of faiths that i described previously um and i think who who really who really helped me was a person in australia um, a very nice colleague victoria schiffer who i talked like three or four times during my time in australia and she was kind enough when i when i um when I landed in Australia to help me with finding a job, getting connected to this amazing community that Australia has in agility. Um, and what she said is like, Peter, if we as coaches in agility or whatever, if we never stop learning, there is always a place for us. It might not be agility anymore because maybe it will be replaced by something new. But if we never stop mm -hmm. learning, there will always be a space and there will always be something that you can contribute to it. And this is a sentence that really is, is still within me. Um, and I would say this is like a driver for me. It's like to challenge myself, especially because if I'm being honest, a lot of the problems I have, they have nothing to do with the outside, even though it's easier to say it's like, oh, it's that person, it's that organization, it's the culture of companies. Usually it starts here with me. Um, and I think this is something that just, it's, it's, it's like exploring. I feel like a detective in the morning sometimes, like, wow, I'm, I'm curious actually to find out what, what else will this day show, show about me? Um, where, where am I blocking myself again? And what, what, because that's, that's what I like or what I hear in your story is that, of course, it's easy to blame the outside. The problem is changing the outside you cannot do. Uh, or you can, but it's a lot harder. If if the problem is on the inside, it's much easier to solve it because uh, it's much easier to solve your own mindset and your own framework. And well, and I say easy, and I immediately think about a few other people will tell e to me like, if you have no idea, it's hard. Yeah. Yes, it's hard, but it's actually a lot easier than changing other people around you because that's even harder. Um, you don't, right? And you can't. Well, we, we can create the environments where people yes. are, are encouraged to do something. And um, I don't believe that it's impossible. It's very easy to change people to, to behave like real assholes, for example, because we can, we can create the incentives and we can do a lot of things. So yeah. I, I do believe that we can change people. Unfortunately, it's much easier to make them behave much better, than, uh, worse than, than much better. So that's the hard part, especially if we want to move them in a certain direction. Um, but so it's possible, but it's a lot harder than changing ourselves. And 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 again, changing others feels a lot like tricky uh, in dealing with them, and and people won't like it. And 
okay, I might not like the version I see for myself in the mirror, a little bit like what you say, sometimes you, you, we are not ready for it. Sometimes it's like the question that your partner said, why is it not possible? Oh, damn it, I have to choose myself. That's, that's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's nice, but it's not nice because it basically means that most of the problems are around me. I, I, I have to blame myself. And I wouldn't say that every problem is, is due to ourselves, but, um, but a lot of the solutions we can we can look at that um, yeah. and and see it. And again, it's a privileged situation because, of course, um, it's it's much easier for uh, a white old uh, Western European dude like myself to say that than it is for a lot of other people in the world. Okay. But it's yeah. an attitude that 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 helps. And if I wouldn't do it, yeah, then it then it's even a lot harder. Totally. People. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on this one. And also, I think that it's the examples that you brought at, right at the beginning of our conversations about us a lot of times like, oh, changing the car, doing this, also buying a lot on the outside. I think it's just a try for us to feel better, but it's nothing that usually is sustainable. So it doesn't really help you win the lottery. I mean, look at a, lo at a lot of these lottery winners actually it didn't help them. So because it's still, you know, this thinking of, oh, the solution is on the outside while well, the solution is in us. I mean, if I don't like a colleague at work, um, I mean, I have two options, right? I can say this colleague needs to change because he's not behaving like I want. Or I can say like, oh, wait, it's something, it's something to do with me. Maybe this person is just triggering a lot of things that are within me. Um, and then I have choices, right? Because then it's easier for me. It's like, okay, I have actually have a choice. How do I behave? Where, where can I change my, my attitude, my also my, my behavior towards that person. Um, but a lot of times we still get triggered by our egos, right? And this is something I think where it's, as you said before, we are all somehow work in progress. Um, and I think no one of us is, is perfect, but it's a lot about actually recognizing and working towards that. Where I'm also, I'm, I'm not perfect. I still have a lot of things that trigger me. Um, and I usually notice then, not in the moment, but later on, it's like in the afternoon, a day later, it's like, oh, shit you did it again but that, that's already rather fast if it's already in the same day or in the same week the, you the, some of the things you you said remind me of the conversation i had some time ago with with gb reinsberger where he said he he, he conversations he had he talked well there's multiple parts where we talked about it but one particular part he talked about managers and he says usually if he asks managers do you really think in really think that a person is really bad behaving of your team and basically they agree no we really think that these people want to behave good okay so and and so he, he starts to empathize and and feel and really passionate about the, the managers and trying to understand their feeling and what he notices is that oh now they're much nicer to their people as well but it starts by him as a coach having much more respect for for the managers to us to understand it where does that come from do you really do you really think negative about your employees no you don't okay I, I don't think you do. So, so let's let's start with that conversation, and 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 then you notice that okay, because they're not the bad people either. They 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 have learned it from different ways, and and so okay, let's have that conversation. Let's see what what happens. And and if a person is really bad on purpose, that's a different kind of conversation you need to have. Then 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 you need to talk about okay, can we change your jobs or whatever to to make you more happy that you want to continue work a little bit like you changing your job to to scrum master that you like much more um but that's a different kind of conversation that okay let's try to encourage person to do better or whatever no most people want to do already a good job most people and and when we learn about that when we emphasize with that and empathize with that that's what i was looking for then then we get a lot more of that um and and that's a little bit what you say yeah we we need to refrain ourselves from from thinking negative about a colleague about a different kind of thing um, it helps. and that's and it helps a lot yeah exactly so, but it helps also you know for ourselves because if we if we understand ourselves it's so much easier for us to also act in a way that will inspire not only leaders but also other people in Oh, there might be a different way of how I can behave, because oh, that then that that, I, that actually brings the, the 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 start of the conversation of GB because that was exactly what he said. I first started to understand myself, 
I had empathy for myself and it's only when I had empathy for myself, now I could start to have empathy for others and, and oh, there is a ripple effect. And yeah. I feel like kind of the, the same kind of conversation. Uh, but yeah, it's it's it, this is where a lot of these things start. Huh? Totally. Um, and it's uh, and like you say, we, we can probably bring it back to a lot of the things in how we were raised and, and what happened around us. Um, and again, we can look at negative or, or positive through it, but the more we start to understand ourselves, the more we know what are our deeper motives, why do we do it, and, and why, I don't know, both the good and the bad parts of ourselves. And, and, and like you said, well, you kind of said it, there is, there is no limit to what we can learn about ourselves. We, we, we can keep doing that, and, and yeah, so... That's the nice thing because you, yeah, it's 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 a little bit like what your your colleague in Australia said. There is, we will still learn, and that will give us opportunities to do the jobs. But for me, the deeper level is it's also very interesting to keep learning about myself and about everything that that's happening. Yeah. Um, that uh, that makes us well for me, and I feel a lot of it with you as well. That that gives that passion about because this is where, where we talk we started talking about uh okay that that's the thing where what what's around is there eh? and okay. and that gives a lot of energy yeah um, it does let's move to that uh, next question that is um, what is your biggest oh basically this is the moment for you to brag where where are you really <laughs> proud of um and I think it connects back to the to the question that we discussed previously. Um, I think my biggest achievement at the moment is really that I, I think for two years now, I really enjoy my life in terms of I see things that I haven't seen before. It could be something simple like, you know, looking outside my window and, and seeing nature as it is, like the small things. And I, I, I also shared it some, a couple of months ago with Michael and Audrey in, in the talk. It's like, I wouldn't say that I had a bad day per se over the last two and a half months, which doesn't mean uh, two, two and a half years, which doesn't mean that I'm not having days where it's challenging, where things don't work out. But in, in the end, the essence is really that, hey, as you said it previously, it's like it's an experience that I've made. It's like, wow, what can I get out of it? What did I learn? And I think my, my achievement is really that I'm able to do this, as, as you said, privilege it's like in a good in a good good um good location um having you know a, a secure job at the moment so it also gives me a lot of time to do this um but at the same time to bring that into workplaces where i can show again it's going back to the being i can show the way i am at the moment and my whole self so i don't have to play a role when i when i go into organizations but i can show who i truly am and to see that through that i can inspire people and th three weeks ago when i was leaving my my company um I, I received a feedback from a colleague which was like hey peter thank you for inspiring me to think differently and i thought wow that was the nicest feedback i ever received because just just think i, I was just thinking about it it's like i inspired someone to think differently i was like wow and it's it, 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 it's really just, nice you know, feedback. I just, I just got goosebumps just, and I think this is something that, again, I think by, by role modeling it, by being authentic. So I'm not BSing someone. It's like, Oh, everything. No, not everything is beautiful, but can we see life as it is? It's full of experience. And also the concept of, I mean, let's be honest. We have, we have limited time here, right? Our time is not unlimited on earth. Um, how can we make the best out of it? How can we make experiences? How can we connect to people? get to know people, do something for them. I think this is my, my biggest achievement so far. And, and if I understand correctly, because you, you, you frame it back to, um, to the last two years, basically. So that's also during the pandemic, which is a very hard period for most of us. Uh, where, where, I mean, it's not that the world is in a good place. I mean, all of us were struggling in multiple ways, but struggling and at the same time, feeling that you can be your authentic self is really right uh, yeah the, the right moment to do that because yeah probably if you would not do that in that exact situation if you back to the the peter that you talked about before yeah 
feeling in a burned out situation in a job you don't like in a situation yeah. where we're in a pandemic we're having a war and everything going on that definitely would not uh, would not have been a healthy place to be in no and it's easier because i think a lot of a lot of this comes to letting go of actually what is going on because a lot of these moments that are happening they don't have a lot to do with me they are just things that are mm. happening so and i think the last two years were a perfect i think for me it was perfect because it gave me the time it gave me the time to be at home to sit down mm. and i just wasn't you know exposed to constantly it's like going out of a meeting meeting people i was not exposed to a lot of things that happen within especially within offices but rather having my own safe space um having a beautiful home having a supporting partner at home so i think all these elements came together um and then having support from people from the community which i think our agile community is still great having support from amazing people like again michael and audrey going through their through their training through their courses and i think with that there was just like this shift within me where it's like oh mm -hmm. it can it can actually be easy mm -hmm. um, I, i like that you you phrase it because uh, well i i I don't think you're saying that the situation was easy, uh, neither for you. I mean, the situation, the whole pandemic, it, I think it's hard for everyone, but it, it also made you or gave you options to, to look and because you like uh, to look at options, you saw the opportunities that, that made uh, it, it possible to, to, to make it better for you. Um, and I think a lot of people, and, and again, um, The goal is not to say, oh, the pandemic was good. No, there's definitely, yeah. I think, none of us, we want to, to go. We, we actually all want to, to have this situation before pre-pandemic in the sense that the world is, is in a better place. But at the same time, we can, we can look and see what, what does it bring us. And for you, it brought the things that you just talked about and, and having that space for this kind of thing. And that, that's a story I've heard multiple times over the last two years from people that looking like, okay, it made me, it gave me time to think the fact that indeed I didn't have to, to go um, one hour of, uh, of traffic in the morning, one hour of that. So basically a lot of people won an hour or two a day yes. that, that, uh, and sometimes I actually invested sometimes that extra hour at the client, but at the same time, uh, some parts for me as well. And, and so that's, uh, so that's uh, basically an hour for the client, an hour for me, that that's good. That's a win-win. Um, It, uh, yeah, it, it, it makes me possible to say I work an hour longer in the evening, but the moment it's finished, I can go. And five minutes later, I'm at a, I'm at a, yeah, I'm at, I'm at the dinner table, or I have a, a meeting uh, scheduled a little bit later. I quickly make dinner, and then afterwards, I do do a meeting or do do something else. So there's that brings a lot of value for for many people at many moments. It does. So. Um, I want to, and that kind of brings me to that that question um, about about the personal agility. Do you have something that you've learned, maybe the last two years, but maybe even before, that that you think is worthwhile to share for everyone? I think, especially throughout the last two years and working from home, I usually always have something like this in front of me, like a, a workbook. Mm -hmm. um, and my personal agility tip is something that we always share with teams it's like check your especially in product teams check your assumptions you're making about your product verify these assumptions as quickly as possible and my personal agility tip is to do this also as as a coach as a scrum master or whatever role you have write down assumptions you are making because throughout the day a lot of things you do is making assumptions about a situation a person something that was said and what, especially at the beginning in a new project what i like to do is i like to write down a lot And then after a week or two weeks, I go back and there is a lot of not true, not true, not true. And this is a way for me to, to see and recognize and accept also, oh, a lot of the things that you are doing are based on assumptions that you are making. Um, so really just... And reviewing you... back of assumptions and, and, yes. and even assumption that, that reminds me of a, a wonderful story I once heard of, of Jerry Weinberg. Jerry Weinberg said that in, in your relationship, he said, at least every seven years, you have to redefine your full uh, relationship. So with your partner and, and every agreement you make, and, and some of them are formally and others are less formally, you have to renegotiate and you have to re-talk about. And he shared the story that he was 
Uh, so he was uh, at that moment, I think, 21 years together with his partner. And one of the things he hated was doing dishes. And so he did the dishes for, for 21 years. And, and one of these uh, seven years uh, things, he, he, he renegotiated with his partner, said, OK, let's, let's see if he, yeah. And he, did, he hated doing the dishes, but he did it because he thought his partner hated doing the dishes as well. And so he wanted to do it out of love for his partner. Turns out that he actually liked doing the dishes and she kind of um, and she let him do the dishes because she loved it and she thought he probably likes it too. So so I offer him the opportunity to do that. And after 21 years, they figured out it's 14 or 21. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's, it's after a, 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 another cycle of seven years, they figured out, oh, actually, it's the inverse. So now they swapped and she was doing the dishes and he no longer had to do the dishes. So for a lot of years, he did it out of love for his wife and out of love wow. for him. She let him do it. And, and that's a kind of assumption. It was like, wow, how could you? Yeah, and, and after a couple of months and years, you're just into that and you don't even talk about it. And oh, um, it's lovely. Yeah, and that, it, it, it's such a nice example of assumptions that we assume that we do and both did it out of love for the other, doing it or not doing it. And it turns out they both misunderstood the assumption and they, and they both had the same, well, the opposite assumption of each other. Um, and... and yeah, when he told the story uh, somewhere late in the bar at at, at uh, it was at the, um, what was it? Uh, not at the conference, but at the training that he shared some some of this. Um, he had a conversation about yeah assumptions in relationships, and and I was like, I was really stumbled about okay, how could you have that? And then the more I thought about it, the more I see so many assumptions that we make on a daily basis about relationships about children about parents about everybody we work with sometimes even the car we have and and, and things like that and yeah. for example if you talked about moving to another country if you go to another country and the steering wheel is on the other side i might just go to 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 the, the wrong side of the car and not realizing it uh yeah and that, that these all a lot of these kind of things that uh, we don't we don't think about um it's uh it's, it's really nice and it's a good idea i think to indeed write down and realizing wait this is an assumption okay i'm writing this down i think that's true but i don't know basically because that's basically what you're saying yeah you you write down what you think is true and then you try to find some time back a week or a day sorry, a week or a day later. And, and so how do you deal with that? So basically you then go back to these people and you say, well, I assume this, is this correct? Is this how you do that or how does, how does that work? So I can give you a concrete example of something that occurred two months ago in a team discussion we had. So there was a, I wouldn't, it was, it was heated, but very respectful. Um, mm -hmm. So I wrote down a couple of things of, oh, they just don't, don't like my idea. They don't understand my idea. And then in the afternoon, that was, that was a, a conversation that happened in the morning. So in the afternoon, I looked back over my over my notes and i was looking at that specific note of they don't like my idea and this is where it came to me it's like wait a second peter this is not you talking this is your ego talking you were not interested in this best solution for the team you were interested in your solution mm. so the next morning i offered that to the team it's like hey yesterday you know in this discussion that we were having um you know just want to be transparent and open with you. I wasn't interested in the best solution for our team. I was interested in my solution. I wanted you to like my idea. Um, and, and, and in a sense, like me as a person, because yes. that's what you said earlier. Yeah, my, my idea is like, because I was, of course, I was convinced by my idea. And then I was like, wait a second, were you even listening to the other solutions? No, it was my ego taking over. And my ego liked my idea. It's like, hey, this is the best idea for the team. Um, and it could be something like this and and, and my, my idea is like be open about it and also there inspire maybe people to do something else because i cannot tell anyone it's like hey you should write a book like this or make notes but maybe it's something that they will then consider and say like oh wait why is peter doing this i mean does he get you know is it like an extra that he so it's just my my idea of especially an in, in, in ego is a very yeah it's it's yeah when there are things said, it's an ego takes over so quickly. Yes. Um, and it, it's, uh, I, 
I always try to say I have a big ego, but uh, I don't have the brains to to deal with it in the sense that I'm I'm not smart for the ego I have. Uh, and it helps me in a sense because I try to work with people who are way smarter than me. And then it's easier for my ego to let go. Because if I realize, okay, this person is smarter than me, it's like, okay, I, uh, but still, if one of these people then, then like an idea of me or, or say nice things about me, it's, it's of course, the first thing that an ego does is, yes, yes, keep coming, come, yeah, come. Yeah, keep, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So it's, it's, it helps uh, me to write it down. It helps me and then check it. And then, you know, also asking that question is like, who is, who was actually writing that down? Who was speaking in that moment? Um, wow. So from like, you could say it's like an ego check um, to see it's like who, who actually was, was part of that conversation. Was it me or was it, was it my ego who was driving that one? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, that's, it's really powerful. If you can, if you can watch back at yourself and see, okay, this was my ego talking or this is, uh, yeah, it's, um, and it's, it's, uh, okay, well, uh, instead of saying it, let ask a question. When you said that to the team, what was their reaction? What, because we didn't want to do that. It was, it was interesting because I think we are still not, especially in our culture, I think we're still not used to, to that openness by someone. So there was a lot of, oh, no, 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 it wasn't. No, no, it, it didn't, it didn't came over as this. So there was a lot of, no, no, Peter, it's not a problem. Um, well, I was just sharing what I felt. So no one could say it's like, it's not true because, but I think there was, we are, we are not there yet to, to talk openly about this one. And again, this is my way to, to make it something because to me, this is human, right? This is part of our human experience to talk about these things because we all have it. We all have an ego. Why can we not talk about it? And why can we not admit it's like, hey, actually my ego was taking part in that meeting and took over. Um, but it's, I think it's something that we slowly will need to get used to it a bit more. But that was a lot of, no, no, you're, no, no, Peter, no one noticed. It's like, well, well, maybe you didn't notice, but it still was true. <laughs> it was true. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's um, um, and it's it, it it well, like you say, you we need to find words to talk about it, and and if people are ready to do it, they might actually catch you in, in the sense that I indeed and in, in, I have some friends and colleagues that I invite to say if you see my ego taking over tell me and uh, and of course i don't let everybody doing that uh I, it, there needs to be a trust relationship um there's many people who can do it even people who didn't i didn't invite to it but, but if i have a trust relationship i feel like okay people might be able to do that um but at the same time at the moment that they might do it it, it might still hurt and might say whoa wait, wait a minute and, and who give you the right to do that and and or now you're wrong and of course probably they are in 99 percent of the cases they're right um but yeah it, it's it's about that kind of questions um to, to understand ourselves where where is that coming from um, but it it helps what you're saying, Eve, is like having someone because that's something my wife does. She is an amazing feedback giver. But my first reaction is when she points something out, like, hey, this was your ego. It, the first reaction is, no, 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 no. Because the ego is so strong. It's like actually saying, no, no, that was not me. But then if you let it settle, it's like, oh, actually, yeah, yeah, you might be onto something. But the first reaction is a lot of times for me, it's just like, no, no, that was that was not. Part. But it is if we are being very honest for me. A lot of times, it but I think a, a lot depends also on how it's said. Eh? I mean, um, I mean, we, you talked already a lot about Michael and Audrey. Michael has a, a good way of asking questions when when we talk with and, and when he's coaching and doing other kind. Because I've I've done a workshop with him more than ten years ago, and he didn't do all everything he's doing now. But even then, the way he was asking questions, it was inviting people to to think about themselves. And of course, if you say, "Oh, Peter, you did it wrong." the first reaction is no but if, if if the question would be more like um okay peter could you tell me some more where is this coming from it's much more inviting yes. to 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 think about where is it coming from mm -hmm. and okay. and and still depending on who it is and what my relationship with that person might be i might still feel attacked if a, if a person that i don't trust at that moment and if i didn't sleep well or whatever even if it's an open question i might still say whoa wait a minute what are you asking but it's already easier at that moment to to let some of that go um so it's a, it's a very good tip i'll uh, i'll definitely try to 
to think much more about about the assumptions i think it's a really hard one so i'm not sure how how easy that will be for me because it's definitely something I'm, i want to try i want to go to that next part of our tips and what have you so we talked about the pandemic and you talked already about working from home in a sense and and in your in your home office from what i understand so yeah. what did you learn about remote working maybe not just the, the the last two years but maybe before as well is there any tip that you can give us so, so i think the major tip is really that it's it's working what i what i hear a lot is oh you know we've lost our personal connection to employees within employees and i must say i think it it requires a different effort but you can still mm -hmm. stay connected so for example um in my in the last two years i i changed companies and a lot of people i still haven't seen in person is it Mm -hmm. I st but I still know a lot about them, but it just requires an effort to, I think, connect to these people. But I still think connection is even because you could say it's like, oh, you know, the two of us meeting here. Uh, what I hear a lot is like, oh, let's meet in real. To me, this is very real. I mean, I see you. I real see you. here. You're real. And, and, and the connection that's is real. It's, that's, yeah, it's, it's that's... real. And I can even feel energy. I, you know, these, all these things. Um, and this is where I think a lot of where we in, in in the circumstances where we hear you know there is there is just not this connection we need people to go back i think it just requires a lot of a different thinking of how do we connect to each other how do we make sure that you know we we talk about each other we talk about not only work related stuff because let's let's two scenarios we have a meeting we have a meeting a physical one usually people would arrive to this meeting room so there would already be some chatting going on. It's like, oh, have you heard about this? Have you heard about this? Then everyone sat down and then the meeting would start. Mm -hmm. What happens in a remote setting? We all join the meeting room and then- As late as possible. As and, late as possible. Uh, and, and we, we don't just... talk until the meeting starts. Yeah. And, and then and we that's, just... that's just a waste of time. Well, for totally. me, it's, it's like, I, I try to ask questions and I try to, to connect and it's, it's hard, but like you say, it's possible, but we need to invest in that. And that's the kind of thing it kind of, well, it feels automatic to many people if, if you're in the office, but it's not, it's something we've learned. Yes. Um, I don't remember who I talked to, but I, I, it's in one of the videos. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll link to it if I, if I find it back later. Um, but it was another video where we, we talked about and we said, actually, when I started working, there were a lot of things that happening in the office that I wasn't used to because I've never done that. And just the thing that you state about going into the meeting room and just talking to people in the first five minutes, I had to learn at some point. And I had to learn at some point to also say, well, wait a minute, I'm just coming out of another meeting. I still need five minutes to 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 rethink and and take notes a little bit. What you said, I might need that to do this to to take and so all these kind of things. Thinking about the previous meeting, uh, arriving in the current meeting, that these were things I needed to think about and and to learn. And I've learned a lot of that over the last twenty years, physically. And now, and the the good thing was. I came into an office where most people around me had already learned it. So I could pick up tricks mm -hmm. and, and here and there from people. And when we moved to the remote things, all of us, well, most of us, we all had to learn it at the same time. And nobody's learning from each other because we're all learning at the same time. Well, it's not true because there's already a lot of people who yeah. worked remote. But still, it's like 80 or 70% of the people had to learn about how, how does that work remote. And in, like you say, many companies have not invested, have have, have tools, and I, I still have meeting, still have companies and clients where they say, let's not turn on the cameras before the meeting because it takes too much bandwidth or whatever, or let's, oh, let's uh, in the beginning of the meeting let's have some music, then it's much nicer. Yes, it's nicer, and I like the music, but I actually like talking to Peter now. Could I could I just talk to him? Um, and and so we try to and for me we're experimenting and some of these things work i mean and and some of them don't and and we need to you need to figure it out and mm -hmm. and like you said we we've never met before and for me we've been talking for more than an hour now and i feel a lot of connections and if we can do this in this of course we're talking a lot of personal stuff here and in work meetings we'll do a lot less 
there is a message there. Maybe we should have some of these talkings. And I assume when you say I joined the company and you have this conversation, I assume you also had conversations about people, about who are you? And that, that's, that's totally. the kind of thing that you know if i also think it's it requires different ways of doing it it's like one one thing that i experimented with and it worked amazingly well is like send people you have you have a group of people eight nine people in a in a team in a meeting um and invest time in sending them in pairs walk outside with their phones because we all have phones we have microsoft teams on it and have a walking meeting where it's mm. three minutes one person talking about a topic it could even be work related personal topic and the other person just listening to you and then reverse the role the other person talking for three minutes and the connection that we saw when these people came back into the main room that was like you know there was this energy there was this smiling because this personal connection actually does something and it also makes it easier to work with each other because i've seen more than just the words about the work-related topic so i think this investing is so important investing in these things and these personal connections um, and it can still work remote. And I, there are a lot of tools out there as well that teams nowadays can use to get these kind of connections, coffee calls, whatever it is nowadays. Um, but you have to put the effort in. And I think, and I think that's it. And there, there has been so much pressure the last year and a half to say, oh, we might lose productivity. Now, we already see, or at least I saw in most teams that productivity didn't suffer. It actually increased for many reasons, but the connections sometimes suffer and it depends on teams. And I've had scrum masters who've been telling me like, I've been focusing so much on, on productivity and efficient, efficiency. And, and now I realized, wait, wait a minute, I have to drop all of that and I have to make sure that everybody is still connected and everybody knows. And, and like you say, work in breakout rooms, have people call each other. Um, I think it was Kitte Klitkart who, who said uh, some time ago that remote teams, actually the good remote teams, they actually call each other much more. So that's the kind of thing that like people actually have phone numbers and it's still, and depending on, if it's a small company, everybody has each other's phone numbers. In a large company, people say, oh, I'm not giving out my phone number. And I'm okay with the privacy. I don't want to, invade your space in multiple things but having a possibility to call someone and and just having a chat it might be video it might be just like you say walking and we both walk in into the woods or in our own garden or whatever um it, it yeah that, that there's a lot there that um that helps and it's it's basically it's the investment that we need to do and it, there's many ideas that we can do, but it's basically all the same. We need to invest time in, in making the connections. And yes. if we do that, that's a um, big surprise. That's that's the same thing. Um, in Dutch, there is a book that, that, that says uh, love is work or the, actually the the um, the the world the word love is a is a verb that's the book that I that I refer to and it's mm -hmm. it's actually it's the same thing if you want to have a relationship working you need to work on it and of course in the first x weeks months days whatever you want to look it's easy because we are so in love and everything works and then there is a moment that it no longer works and you have to do the work to make sure and that's the same at work you have to invest all the time. And, and sometimes, and especially if we're young, then we kind of say, okay, it's not working, let's move to another relationship. And after a few relationships, you realize, oh, wait a minute, it's not working, but maybe it's me, maybe I, I'm to whatever, yeah. uh, I need to do a little more investment into, the, into this partnership if I really want to well, stay with someone or have someone stay with me and, and work hard on myself. And like you said, on the partnership uh, that's the so. same for remote working out there but you know there's one i think element that we are completely underestimating when it comes to remote working is you've mentioned it is like the time saving that we have nowadays right it's like with a yeah. lot of us not needing to commute anymore because I, i've heard recently a, a term that i never heard before there is like this usually we have around 30 years that we need to work right in our lifetimes like Mm -hmm. A lot of us start around 25 and then we retire around 65, especially in, in Western uh, Europe. Um, and recently someone, I can't recall who because I'm really bad with these names, but someone said it's like, okay, this is the time 
worked, but what about the real time worked? And what if we add to it the commute we have every, every week? What if we add all the overtime that we do? We actually work a lot more than 35 years in our lifetime because if you add all of this, because this is not for free, like I mean, a lot of us has to have to commute two hours a day. I mean, if you calculate that a week, that's 10 hours that we actually give away. And this is what I thought. Super yeah, and then it depends what we, we do with it. If we use that time, if you're if you're on a train and you listen to books or if you listen to podcasts, you still learn. If you would be on a train and you would be knitting uh, a sweater, then you would still use it. Uh, whatever, it, it, it depends on what you do. If you're sleeping, if, for example, I have to go to Brussels and I... In the morning, I wake up very early. Then I probably might be sleeping more. To to so, but still, it's time I have to that I spend differently. Yeah. There is an interesting book that I learned from G. B. Reinsberger, fifteen years ago. I don't know, a lot of years ago. That says, uh, I think the, the book is called Your Money or Your Life or something like that. And in one of the the things in that book is about we think about how much money do do we make and what the book is asking is it. For the things that you spend in your life, um, so if you want to buy a coffee or a new MacBook or a new iPhone, think about how many hours you have to work. So that's one thing. But in that thing that he talks or that that person, I think it's a she that she talks about, is um, she says, don't talk, think about the 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 eight hours but think about the 10 hours that you're talking about so it's not just the time the f you need to think about the full time the full time that you're away from your family because you didn't get paid for for 10 hours you only get paid for eight hours but actually you need to look at that money and divide it by 10 instead of eight and mm -hmm. and do that calculation on that and gb told me like um, when he did that calculation, he realized, oh, that latte that I drink in the morning, that is $5, that's actually rather expensive because I have almost, I don't know how many time, but let's say, uh, well, let's exaggerate a little bit. You have to work a full hour to, to earn that latte. Well, maybe that's, that's not worth it. But that laptop that I'm using and that I'm using for, uh, I exaggerate in the other direction, for five years, it's an expensive uh, laptop, but if I use it for five years, that actually is is worth my time because mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. makes that if I compile code, if it compiles twice as fast, I don't have to wait that long. So maybe, and and he was talking, and I don't remember the, the full details and but but part of it was I don't want to spend money anymore on the laptop uh, on the on the latte. That laptop that I didn't want to buy is actually a much better investment for my time, and so because that brings me value during the the full eight hours and so that was a really interesting conversation to think about what you said mm -hmm. is that look at that full timeline that you're working um and 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 that's the easy version because then it's also like we think that's just the time frame no no we we also take holidays in europe we take a lot more holidays than than in the united states if i take two weeks of holidays i actually have to calculate them in because um I, I don't make any money in that time frame, but the money I make during the rest of the year is also used for that. For so that, I yeah. actually have so I actually have to do okay every day with 10 and then the full and there's a lot of uh, it, it, I like I said it's 15 years ago that I read the book um but it, it really made me think a lot about about money and about how do I spend my time because that's mm -hmm. that's what what this is all about. And yes. this is what a lot of people learned in the pandemic. Oh, wait a minute. I spent two hours a day in traffic and 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 we were so all used to it. And that was the only possibility. And we started working maybe from 10, 10 minutes away from, from home. And then we got a better job and it was 20 minutes. And then we got a better job and it's an hour. And, and now we're into the pandemic and it's like, oh, I just want two hours a day. And yes. again, I'm exaggerating. It's not for everyone the same thing. But a lot of people start realizing, oh, I could use a lot more. And it's actually for me, for example, if my I have teenagers, so if they if uh, in the middle of the pandemic, everybody was at home, that also meant at lunch, I have time to have lunch with my family. So that's another half an hour over an hour extra, which I mm -hmm. would not have in, in other cases. Yep. Um, and so so, yeah, that's a lot of people thought about the whole other concept about other time. Totally. So it's, um... 
That's uh, a lot of things about remote work and what that brings us. Um, let's move to that uh, other question about what's a book you have read? And we talked already briefly before about it. So I think you have the book with you, if I'm yes, correct. I have it. Um, so this is the latest book of this author. I'm not sure if a lot of the audience is familiar with um, this author called Michael Singer. Um, it's the last book that I've read, but it's also his previous book, which is called The Surrender Experiment, I think is the book that I wrote it, I think, to you in the, in the, in the email before. It's the book, one of these books where you don't know who bought it at home. You don't know how it was at home, but it was just there at the right moment at the right time. So I, was, I, was, I can get, give you a bit of a story about this one. So I was in Italy vacationing and I was just going through this entire program by, by Michael and Audrey. Um, and it was on the 3rd of, 3rd of October in 2020, where I had a shift in, in me. There was really a shift where I was, I think, recognizing for the first time, wow, Peter, you are the problem, but also you are the solution. Um, so that was already an amazing moment. And then I found this book in the middle of our baggage. Um, my wife doesn't know how it landed in there. I don't know. No one knows how, who bought it. But then there's this author actually telling all these things about life, about how, you know, the earth, the earth, it, it took billions of years to be exactly like it is now. And all we humans do is say, I don't like it. I don't like if it's, you know, if it's raining, I don't like it. It's like, and his, his idea is really to acknowledge the beauty that we have surrounding us. It's like, we have trees, we have things happening. Also, he's going against this, you know, people are going to the Mars, going to the moon. And he's saying like, there's a lot of dirt up there. There's nothing else to see while we on this earth is like circling around in this space there is so much going on we have colors we have nature we have things we have humans to interact with um and i was like wow how did this book find me because it was just at the right time was, again this concept of letting go of your preferences letting go of things that you take personal because the moments will happen anyway but you are making them a problem because you are making them personal because what would have happened if you would have not noticed this problem or this situation? It would have just been a situation. Um, mm -hmm. And he just, and since, since, since then, I think he's someone who inspires me a lot through his books. He's also having weekly um, podcasts he's recording. Um, an amazing human being, uh, which teaches me at least um, a lot about how easy life can be. Um, but how we, a lot of things, we put a lot of suffering into it. Um, with very mm. basic examples like the weather. I mean, I can wake up in the morning and say, like, I don't like that it's raining, but it will not change anything. Just because I don't like it, the rain will not stop. Or driving in front of someone, maybe you know the situation, you drive in front of someone who is very slow. Um, we get angry a lot of times, it's like, oh, why can't he drive faster? Nothing changes if we are being angry about it. And his idea is really to... Well, we, we, we kind of want to yeah, get angry and shout, but that doesn't make things better. And, and think it's, it's more the opposite. It's, um, yes. yeah, I, the, especially the weather I recognize because I, I am purposely, I don't have any weather apps on, on my phone. Uh, if my computer comes with it, I try to throw it away from it or get it deleted. Not always possible. I don't like that, Microsoft, if you're listening. Um, um, but it's... Um, yeah, I have a few people around me that look at the weather and say, oh, tomorrow we we need to do this because then the weather is good or the weather is bad. And I, I don't care. I mean, especially if you want to, to give a, a party, uh, it's like, yeah, the weather will be what the weather will be. And yes, we can prepare. And of course, if it's the middle of summer, there's more chance that there is good weather than, than, than bad weather. And we can prepare a little bit for it. But I, my day is not better or worse when there is rain or there is no rain. Um, I, I, if it's a situation I can handle, of course, if in my home I can, I can close a window to make sure that I don't get wet and, and stuff like that. But, but other than that, my, I would, I don't feel any better if the sun is out or, or not out. I don't let that change, change too much a little bit. It's, um, but it's very tempting to, and, and it's not only that. What I see with people with, with weather apps is that we sometimes get annoyed about the bad weather that's going to happen that did not yet happen. Um, and and so yeah, we, want to, it's, we want to predict this, uh, want to, yeah, it's like, okay, we, we can, 
I will always take a coat with me, even if it's good weather or bad weather. I don't even want to think about it. I just have a coat with me and, and then it's there. And if it's too hot, I'll, I'll take it out. But I have it with me. I don't want to check up front, good, bad, whatever. I don't care. It, it, it's what it is. Um, and, and But it's it's indeed, it's a mindset we need to get into. And it's 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 very tempting. And like like you say, we have lots of things around us surrounding us both people and apps and other kind of things that want to give an opinion about you should feel bad because this you should feel good because of that uh and no we can try to see when that happens and i think it's um how is it called um dr coffee who wrote about who, who told me and um I, I i did a training and he he, he used the um, um what is it called um a kind of citrus um fruit and he said if i throw the throw this to the wall what will happen and you get you get you get orange juice basically if i if i put the orange on the floor and i step on it what do i get i get orange juice if i step it over with or if i drive my car over it i get orange juice and and so basically the orange has no way um to 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 make a choice everything that happens to this orange you get orange juice um and he says we people we are some of the only species on earth where we actually have a choice we can decide on how we react to that and and so we we have a, a moment and there is a space in between something happening and our reaction and 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 that's that's the thing where we can make a decision like you say there is a car driving too slow in front of you you can make a conscious decision to not get angry about it you make a decision you might i don't know and it's yeah it's um but it's hard it's, it's, hard. it's something it's it's, it's hard. we need to do it and and i like the way you phrased it earlier on it's a conscious decision you need to make to not become angry because our default is getting angry yeah, why doesn't he drive faster and the more i do it the more angry i get and the more i pay attention and the more it's like yeah it's yeah. it doesn't help me <laughs> no, no and it's it's it's, a, it's about you know it's also this human concept we're carrying so much stuff around it's like you know we could talk about a person now that i don't know but you know hey peter you should absolutely meet harry and i had someone in my past harry who was always he was an angry boss he was shouting at me and without knowing your harry i already something happens within me it was like oh i probably don't will not like harry because I make that connection. And this is how our human concept is a lot of times. It's like, but this Harry has nothing to do with my own Harry, but I still stored him inside. And, and this is really what this author, Michael Singh, is going all about. It's like, hey, let go of these things because they will, they will direct your life and you will not be able to see very clearly in these situations. Well, I like to point that back also to your assumptions that you say, because sometimes they are right. I mean, I recorded, um, I had a conversation with a possible boss and I, I love the job, but I kind of had a, an icky feeling about mm -hmm. this is not right. And so by coincidence, the next conversation I had with that boss on the phone and I've recorded that full conversation because I really felt, and we were negotiating really about my contract and everything. And I recorded every single word of it because i didn't trust that person turns out to be the worst boss i ever worked with i i worked for a long time for that person but i totally didn't trust him and he was this person was not trustworthy he asked me to lie to clients and did lots of unethical things um but i knew it right from the start and um and I didn't trust my own gut feeling at that time. And it cost me a lot of money. I'm, I'm still happy that I did the work because I love the work. I love my colleagues. I learned a lot, but definitely it was the worst boss I ever worked with. And, uh, and so, like I said, this cost me a lot of money, but for me, I'm okay with it now because that's the kind of money that I say it was a kind of education for myself mm -hmm. to trust my gut feeling. Yes. So, um, I, I understand the, the part that you say, I don't trust that that hairy person, uh, but it would be, that's a good kind of assumption to write down and to then check, okay, where is that coming from? Oh, it's coming from Harry Potter or whatever other Harry that, that you met before. Um, uh, and, and that's a good thing to, to know where it's coming from or it's because, oh, somehow I already heard another person talking about that same Harry that Eve is talking about and no, I don't, I don't trust it. And that's, that's a good way to 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 use that and and this is where i think both 
how do I call it? Both concepts work really well together. It's just learning when to trust your gut feeling and, and when not to, and, and in both directions, um, especially about people. I think it's good to, to indeed be open and then to be ready to to challenge your own assumption and to check where is this coming from and then gradually opening trusts until you so at, at the level that you say okay no this this yeah. person okay. cannot be trusted or can actually be trusted more uh i, I, I had it, oh, I, this reminds me sorry this will take another five minutes as a story but um i've had this at the at the at a very large corporation years ago where um, I was trying to create much more psychological safety into the team and into everything. And I felt that there was a lot of distrust in this team. And um, at some point, and I still remember, I still know the exact day that it happened, is that uh, I had um, a small little cup, copy cup at, at, at my table, at, at, my, um, at my desk. And somehow I got, I don't know, five euros back from, from something. And I was looking and said, okay, let's let's put this in this copy cuff. So they were all coins just to see what happens. And indeed, in less than a week, uh two dollars were uh, two euros were were left out. So it was like this is this, and I, I've done it a lot since then. Don't always do it, but I've done it a lot since the last 10 years. To so just try it as a kind of test to say, okay, how trustworthy is this? And and it's uh, it's five euros. It's it's not nothing, but it's also not a lot of money. But it's good to learn about how trustworthy is this team, and of course, depends if if there is uh, cleaning personnel or if it's just a closed team or whatever. But it's uh, it's actually very interesting, and I've, I've actually had this that I noticed. I come to my office and I see oh, there's only two dollars left, uh, two euros left, and then uh, before the meet the first meeting starts, somebody comes to me and says, oh, Eve, by the way, yesterday I was out of money and I needed this to have a snack, and I borrowed a little bit of money. Here's your three two euros back left okay that's the kind of way that you know this is trustworthy and that that is actually working um so it's it's an interesting concept mm -hmm. to try yeah. trust in 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 a way of course not everything is about money it's also about how you can trust people with their with with what they're saying and everything but yeah it's, it's something i've tried over time and that helped me a lot uh to learn about yeah how uh, trustworthy are people mm. in my team basically that's an interesting nice small experiment i like that it's a, well it's it's a cheap one that you can basically yeah. try oh, but you have to work physically it doesn't work remotely that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> not yet we have to think about a different concept yeah. <laughs> well if, if i have it at my desk here and it's it gets away i have to look back at the the, the non-co-workers with me you you would have it's a mirror board and when you see your sticky notes are disappearing then probably i don't know yeah it's, it's something like that Okay, I want to go to, for me, the one of the most interesting questions is that what question do you think I should also ask you and, and what's the answer? Mm. Uh, I was thinking hard about that one. And then yesterday in the evening, one popped up and it was, my question would be, what would you would like to know, would have liked to know when you were 14? Um, wow, that's a powerful to which, one. To which my answer would be i would i would have liked to understand a lot more about these concepts that we are also just discussed about the concepts of life the concepts of choices because i think when i when i go back to my time when i was a teenager 14 15 as i said in the beginning i thought there's just this one way um but knowing that you know first of all time here is limited so nothing is unlimited here um and to not live my my life as it would be unlimited because that's so easy to do is like you know bothering it about all, all about these small things but really this concept of choices that you know just because you make a decision now it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the, it's the end of until the end of your if your life because if i look back i mean there was there were so many things that changed for me moving countries moving jobs um moving roles that i do also from from a from a from a human perspective, the way I change as a human, um, I would have liked to understand a lot more about this when I was younger and would have also loved maybe that in school we talk about these things about, hey, how can I work on myself? How will it help me to open up to others? How will it help me to support others instead of let, learning about, I mean, it, there are important things, but it's this concept that to me is and was completely 
missing in, in my school environment where I was in. It's like understanding more about me, about how my mind works, my brain, how does it work? What about patterns? All these things I would have loved and I think it would have, it would have helped with a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, if I yeah, look around now, I, I also hear that. Well, also about options that you have, because what I see, if I look at at my teenagers, for example, and and at their friends, a lot of them have the 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 concept in mind that, for example, the 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 selection of the the thing to do. Uh, so I have one who's in um, at the end of um, uh, I don't know how to, is that the secondary school I don't know mm -hmm. it's, it's, he's, he's 17 turning on 18 so he has to choose university or something else and yeah. a lot of people around the age and I see a lot of parents are saying like this is the most important decision in your life I'm like in a way yes but no I mean yeah. it, it 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 shapes a few of the directions and it turns off certain options if you don't select certain things but you can change back any kind of option. And for me, it's like, you should dare to jump into that, better to try something that doesn't work because yeah. you, you will regret if you don't do it. Um, and and a little bit like what you say, choose an option that, that basically creates more options later on. And and if you have to choose between two of them and, and you don't know, well, choose the one where you can easily revert back and, and do something else. If you would make a decision and that would, yeah, I, I have no idea, but any kind of decision that would jeopardize the rest of the world more, well, maybe try something else first and, and, and see then. Totally, um, yeah. And that's, that's the kind of thing I think indeed we don't teach teenagers and, and well, anywhere, even adults. There's so many people who still think my first job is the most important decision and whatever is like, yeah and no you change you basically what i heard you say is i changed and worked in a different country so basically you could have tried and done any kind of thing yeah. you could um it, 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 it's the moment that you can redefine everything you are um yeah. and, and doing that and that's that's and that's what you did and in a sense when your friend told you oh there is some other kind of job that maybe you like better and um, also you know when when we when we talk about universities I think there are a lot of jobs that the, the two of us now, we are not even aware that they exist already in the world. And we are not even aware that the, what, what jobs will be created within the next 10 years. I mean, now we see a lot of, you know, jobs that I think 20 years ago, no one knew about it. So well, the, you know, the, 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 just a scrum master. I mean, no if you look back at that, well, depending on when you want to go back to the first uh, version of Scrum, uh, it's 1996. If, if you if you listen to some parts of the history, not many people were doing it. But still, let's say 1996. Well, I was studying in in 91 till 94. So it didn't exist at that time. So agile coaching, well, nobody called himself because it didn't exist. So, yeah, so it, 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 didn't, it wouldn't even make sense to to make a choice based on that. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of the jobs that are existing now, they might not even exist in, in a couple of years for yeah. whatever reason. And and we have no idea which one, because I used to, when I was younger, they'd say, yeah, a lot of things will go away, but computers, but for example, building houses, that will never go away, things with your hands. But now we see that there are actually robots that are able to build houses and, and to do that. It's it's different and there is a different kind of style and, and probably there still will be a lot of people building houses for the next couple of decades. Uh, but the, the, I, I can imagine that a lot of other kind of houses might be built by robots or maybe yeah. skyscrapers or whatever. So parts of these jobs are going away. And, and, and so a lot of others, uh, yeah, jobs don't exist, won't exist anymore in 20 or 30 years. And a lot more jobs will, will become new. And, and that's, that's the thing. Um, so it, it's, it's a good thing to think indeed at, at 14, 15 about, hey, what else is there in life? How could I think differently? And pointing it back to one of the other things is, okay, what drives you is learning all the time and learning about yourself. Because if we can learn this at 14 or 15, our lives would have been completely different. Yes, it's, totally. um, it's It's the kind of thing. And it's hard. Huh? I, I, with teenagers, I see. I Also, as a parent, it's kind of, you want to learn them, but at the same time, 
you also know they have to discover a lot of that themselves it's just like we told earlier on you cannot change people and yeah you because maybe at 14 somebody around you tried to teach you what you just said peter and well mm -hmm. your 14 year old probably didn't version of you did was not ready for that kind that's, of message that's another point yeah Okay, I want to go to um, what's the person that uh, that you think I should invite next? Um, so I have one specific person in mind. Um, his name is Christian Hofstetter. Um, he's also based in Switzerland. Um, I got to know him, I think, one and a half years ago. And to me, he is just a role model, a role model in the energy he brings into things, the enthusiasm that he brings into trying out new things. So we, we got to know each other. We saw each, each other in like in person physically once, but mm -hmm. are constantly connected through, you know, a sparing partner for new ideas. But it's this, this energy he brings as a human, amazing, I would say amazing human being in being authentic, being interested in someone else, um, and also being willing to share connections he has, connect all things that he's doing at the moment. Um, someone I really admire, and I'm so happy to, you know, to to also have him as a part of this community in Switzerland. Um, just an amazing, humble human being. Um, so yeah, I would highly recommend talking to him because, um, as I said, um, he's just an amazing human. Well, and it's for me, it's nice because it's another person I don't know yet. I, I think I know a few people in, in, uh, in Switzerland, but uh, it's definitely a community I don't know much. Uh, I've been to Zurich. Uh, I think it was Zurich. I don't remember anymore. I've been to Switzerland once uh, to talk about um, at a, what's it called? Agile Tour. Switzerland, I don't know, it was mm -hmm. years ago. Um, I, I still remember it was in the weekend because my daughter was uh, had her, it's uh, it's uh, was her, what was it, second birthday. So um, it, it, I have, uh, it's an interesting story to tell as well. I have, um, I had the idea, I, I always want to be uh, with my children on their birthday. So that's uh, an assumption I had, but the assumption was bigger. The assumption was I need to be home with them. And then I was invited to that conference and was like, damn it, I really want to go and it's nice. And, so, mm -hmm. and then it, it occurred to me, but wait a minute, the assumption or the, the, the promise I made to myself is I want to be with my family at, at their birthday. But the assumption is I have to be home. No, I don't have to. So I, I flew back. I flew my whole family to, to and I, I don't remember, it could be Zurich or somewhere else, but it was definitely Switzerland. Um, it was actually close to to France because I remember that um, we, I, I, we 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 were close there, uh, so I'm not sure exactly where it was. But um, but we went with the whole family and uh, and we spent the weekend there. And I think on Sunday it was a conference or on Monday. I don't remember anymore. But I do remember that yeah we we spent the whole weekend there. Uh, and I was like oh that's also another option. Uh, talking about yeah. assumptions like. The, the the concept was the same, but instead of doing that, it's 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 bringing everybody. It was an expensive thing, uh, but it turned out that the conference was really interested, and I was invited later on to have a workshop in at uh, at another uh, company in um, in Switzerland. Actually, I was invited to workshops at CERN at that moment, so that was uh, kind of nice as a result. So that kind of paid back everything I paid for that weekend. So uh, it was nice to to do that kind of thing. But I also assumed that was a long time ago. So you, you have to visit again. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's way, it's way. It was before we went to Bordeaux. So yeah, my daughter is 14. Uh, she was 12 at that 12, uh, two so. at that time. So it's 12 years ago. That's easy to calculate that. time so to revisit it. Time to yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, but it's it's that's why I was saying I really want to to get this is part of why I do this this series. I want to reconnect with old friends uh, like Michael and GB, but I want to learn and get make connections with new friends, and that's the nice thing about again doing this remote kind of thing. I can stay at home. I I can already actually smell that dinner is ready, so I will. Uh, it's it's already nice. Uh, so I can I can do all of that from home, and 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 still connect with with people around the world and get to know more people. Um, 
and it's um, yeah it's different huh? of course if you go to a conference you be there and you're fully emerged in for a day a week whatever the time it is so it's different but it's also um how many times do we take to actually spend an hour or it's almost two hours that we've been talking at a conference with just one person at best you spend a lot of time in the bar in the evening but then it's yeah. with four or five people and you have really interesting conversations with, with multiple people so at best you talk half an hour with one person very specific before sure. someone else jumps in and whatever so we never get to really meet the person this level deep or at yeah. least not for me and this is why I like doing that, and that's uh, that's the thing. So, you, so I want actually to thank you for this for this conversation and to bring me some someone else I can learn from from Zurich. Um, it was Zurich as well, or it's just Switzerland that is. Uh, Switzerland. So he's based near Bern. So yeah. okay. So. So I, I made over, again assumptions uh so it's a different kind of thing but still um a community uh member that i don't know and i want to uh, close our conversation with uh, asking what is a way for people to connect with you so if people want to reach out connect chat and invite me for i don't know a conversation like this or a shorter one um the best way to reach me is on linkedin where i'm active where also if people want to that's have a look one. at that's the one yeah also if people want to have a look it's like how is peter thinking this is probably where they can get uh, the best version of who i am um and always i'm always open that's what i say is like really it's like if you want to chat making a connection um i usually like to take time for this because I, as i think you also saw in this conversation i like doing this just getting to know you now also over the two last two hours um I think this is what what makes life so so valuable well i can i can only say that uh, the whole process of yeah getting sorry getting connected to you having the pre-talk and everything we did it, it was inspiring we said i said earlier on i try to go between one hour and one hour and a half sometimes it gets longer and yes this is again a nice example um of, of two hours and uh i don't even want to apologize to the people listening if you're still here it means that you find it interesting um i cannot imagine that you scroll just to the last five minutes that probably if you're here you still were interested and you you liked it as much as possible um i can only invite people indeed to connect to peter and to uh I, I, we didn't talk about it, but uh, I keep getting the request from, or the remark from people. You should really mention much more if people like things in the interview that they can just comment out because we talked a lot, a lot of things, the tips that Peter gave um, with personal agility. Do you write down these assumptions? Do you do this or the remote things and everything else? So if you have any ideas, if you're inspired with that, please share that with us and uh, we'll definitely keep it on you. So. Thank you very much, Peter, for your time. Thanks to and, you. Uh, let's, uh, let's keep in touch. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Who's Agile, where the stories of agilists come to life. I hope you liked today's interview. Subscribe if you're not subscribed and want to get to know other agilists.